changing topics. Um, we are going to be talking about cell membrane transport, really how you get things to go in and out of cells. And I know that you've probably learned this in 1610 before, but what I really want you to get out of it from the phys perspective is how do I predict? So this figure right here is showing you a bunch of different things that are moving by different mechanisms. How do you predict which direction something's gonna go? How do you predict whether it would use active transport, meaning ATP is required, or passive transport, meaning ATP is not required? How do you predict whether it would diffuse straight through the membrane or need a transport protein or something like this? Um, so what I really wanna give you guys is a really good predictive framework so that even though um, you haven't met this particular amino acid before, you know what it has in common with other things, that size, that charge, and so you can get a good predictive capacity as to how it would be transported. And remember when we're talking about fizz, we're always trying to get to the why it matters as well, so I'm gonna try to give you guys some of that as well. Okay, um, so mechanisms of moving things across the plasma membrane just to get us started. So yeah, I know you guys have met plasma membranes before. You probably had it for the first time in seventh grade and then you had it again in 1610. And a plasma membrane or a cell membrane is of course a phospholipid bilayer with embedded proteins, among other things. Um, what's its function? It is really the bouncer of the cell. It separates, let's just say that this is the ICF down here and this is the ECF up here. It separates the ICF and the ECF, but it allows for things to come in and out, but only selectively. So you're always referring to this term of selective permeability. Um, so what selects? what is doing the selecting. It's not sentient. It's not saying like a bouncer does, you're misbehaving, you get out, you're really cute, you can come in. It's not doing any of that. Primarily what it's doing is the phospholipid bilayer has its chemical characteristics and then the solutes that are trying to get in and out have their chemical characteristics. And there's a relatively predictable way to figure out how those things are going to interact with one another. So there's this really cool interactive animation that I've got linked in your notes. It's right here and I've got it pulled up right here. And it just kind of shows you and gives you a little bit of instructions about like, okay, I wanna know how oxygen is going to be transported. You can look at oxygen and then it tells you about oxygen. It'll tell you a little bit more about diffusion, but can I transport glucose the same way as I transport oxygen? No, glucose is going through this transporter. And what we're gonna get to as we go through this is trying to figure out why oxygen can get straight through the cell membrane and glucose can't why some things need protein pumps or channels or those kinds of things. And so hopefully by the time we get finished with this topic, as we get into the real physiology, as we're starting to talk about insulin and glucose transport and the endocrine system and how that all works and what kind of pathologies exist, um, like diabetes, um, we will be able to immediately put it back together with the transport mechanism and go, okay, well, that is actually the glucose transporter is a carrier protein. And so if you couldn't get it in the carrier protein, then this would happen and that would happen. So that's my goal here, not just rote memorization. Okay, so let's go through some things that you have to consider if you wanna know whether something can get in or out across a cell membrane. The first thing that you consider is size. Size does matter. So you have, um, let's make a prediction. Something is really enormous. Something is this size right here. Is it going to have an easier or harder time getting through than something that is this size? Well, you've been around for a while, so you can probably predict that, generally speaking, smaller things are easier to get in and out of the cell membrane than larger things. Okay, the next thing you have to consider is um, polarity. Okay, okay. So the big thing is gonna have a hard time getting across. There you go. How about charged things? You may not remember about electrical charges and polarity, but if something is uncharged, it's just X versus X plus. Um, X is going to have an either easier time getting in and out than X plus. And that is because um, 
Charged things like ions are polar and therefore not lipid soluble. And what is most of this thing made of? Most of that thing is made of lipid. So if you have a hard time getting through lipids, you are going to have a hard time getting through the cell membrane. Now that doesn't mean they can't cross. So look at this little guy right here. This is showing you sodium crossing. But the way that charged things generally cross is that they are generally going to use what we call channel proteins. So let's show you guys a picture of a channel protein. Here's what channel proteins look like. They're not huge and they are primarily for transporting relatively small things and by small, just think about this. Um, what is going to be bigger between these two things? Don't pay attention to charge for just a second. Na+, plus, which is basically a, a single atom um, that lost an electron, or mm, HCO3 minus, which one's bigger? All right, the HCO3 minus is going to be bigger. So bigger, um, you're going to have a harder time getting through channels as you get bigger. So what about C6H12O6? Now that's big too, right? So channel proteins are primarily for relatively small things. And um, it's a good way to make a little hospitable place for something charged to get across the cell membrane because it's really kind of avoiding the um, phospholipid portion of the cell membrane. Okay, the next things that you have to consider is um, solubility um, and solubility is the thing that you're getting um, trying to move across is it water soluble or lipid soluble lipid soluble substances all of them tend to be nonpolar and therefore they can move across the cell membrane really easily because they are lipid soluble so a great example of something that's lipid soluble is this guy right here which is oxygen is lipid soluble and it moves in and out down its concentration gradient doesn't have to pay any attention to anything. Um, some hormones are lipid soluble, fatty acids obviously because they're fat. Alcohol is lipid soluble, oxygen gas is lipid soluble, those have no problem going in and out. They generally move down their concentration gradients but they have no problem by um, no problem being transported across the cell membrane. But then what about things that are water soluble? If it's water soluble, then um, you have to consider other things. You have to consider, okay, is it really small? Then it might be able to sneak in. If it's mid-sized, um, you might need a carrier for it. And if it's huge, you might have to consider something different altogether. So let's go back to this little video. So let's talk about a couple of water soluble things. So, um, hold on just a second. Water soluble, um, like carbon dioxide is water soluble. Water is obviously water soluble. A lot of times those can be small enough, meaning small enough molecules to sneak through. So let's ha see what happens with carbon dioxide. So let's move carbon dioxide. Let's move you. So carbon dioxide can move straight across the lipid bilayer. But now let's try water. Water is obviously water soluble and about the same size as carbon dioxide. It's kind of strange though because it has two different transport mechanisms. It's small enough, I'll do that one more time, that it can kind of sneak through the cell membrane, but it also has these little channels called aquaporins, which we didn't even know about when I was in college, but they're little bitty water channels all over the cell. They're so abundant that we hardly noticed them. Um, okay, but what about something um, slightly bigger? Glucose is water soluble because you know sugar dissolves in water. Um, but it's bigger because it's C6H12O6. So can it sneak across? Can it use a channel? No, it's too water soluble to sneak across and it's too big to use a channel. So what's the next thing that it can do? Well, glucose actually uses um, a carrier. They're calling it a glute transported here, but it's a type of carrier. And we'll get into carriers. Carriers are different than channels because look at our channel. Notice that if I use this potassium channel, it doesn't change conformation with some, when something moves across. But when I use this um, 
glucose channel. The glucose channel changes conformation when it moves across. It actually binds to the thing that it's going to transport and then it moves and then it, put, it puts itself back into position. Okay, but what about if I needed something really, really big, like huge protein, tons of amino acids all stuck together, and I need to get that out? Well, that is a really, really slow, very energetically expensive way to move things out, but sometimes it's necessary. And so let's say we made an enzyme or a protein inside the cell. How do we get it out? We have to do exocytosis. So there are generally ways to move things, but how do you predict how you would move something. Um, cells are mm, frugal and lazy and they will try to move everything the cheapest, fastest way that they possibly can. So cheapest, fastest fa way first is what's going to happen. So let's just talk just briefly about what's cheap and what's fast by a little whiteboard. Okay, so just drawing a little whiteboard and this is the ICF and this is the ECF. So let's move a few things. Let's move oxygen gas, which is lipid soluble. That can move straight in and out across the plasma membrane anywhere it wants to. It's going to be super cheap, costs you pretty much nothing. And it's going to be super fast because it has no limit to the number of places that it can actually be transported. And now let's move one more thing. So this, by the way, this process that we're seeing right there is simple diffusion. Um, okay, so let's move potassium. Oh no, let's move a sodium ion. Sodium ion cannot, can we agree that it can't go straight in because it's charged and therefore not lipid soluble, so that's not possible. So what can it do? Well, it can move through a channel. So let's make this a channel. But conceptually, does that channel look like it's going to be the same speed as simple diffusion? It's going to be the same cost, right? It's not going to cost you any ATP, but is it going to be as fast if you are limited to moving sodium only at that location? Hopefully you can see that that is going to be slower. So let's put them in order of speed. This is the fastest. This is slower, still cheap. Now I want to try to move something else. I want to try to move glucose, which is C6H12O6. And we know we need it inside the cell because cellular respiration. But can it do simple diffusion? No, it can't because it's water soluble and it's big. Can it move through a channel? It can't because it is too big for a channel. So what do we have to do to move glucose? This is going to be a bad drawing. You'll get a good one later. But glucose, let's say that glucose is this triangle shape. Glucose has to bind to this carrier and bind to the carrier. And then the carrier has to change conformation and then dump the glucose in and then put itself back in a position so it can grab the next glucose. So this is a carrier. And what do you think about speed? Is the carrier going to be faster or slower than simple diffusion or a channel? I would argue that it's going to be slower because not only is it limiting the location that you can move things, but it's also requiring the binding and the changing of the shape. So I'm going to say that this is slower. Then um, what about um, the last possibility? And there are more possibilities, but we'll get to it. Um, uh, active transport a little bit later. What about endo or exocytosis? Um, exo, let's do exocytosis and endocytosis are really energetically expensive. They require a whole bunch of ATP. And so of these four, this is going to be the slowest, although there are some other active transport ones that we'll add in a little bit later. So that's just an intro to get you guys started thinking about um, the types of transport and getting to predict. And so now um, we are going to, um, in the next um, set, in the, in the next video, I'm going to teach you guys the types of channels that exist. And then we'll get into the types of transport after that. So that's enough for this one.